you. Good morning, Chairman Williamson and the Commissioners of the United States International Trade Commission. My name is Pallavi Shroff, and I'm honored to be here today on behalf of the Confederation of Indian Industry, or CII. CII is the National Federation of Industries with a commitment to fostering not only the growth of business in India, but also the U.S.-India trade and investment by supporting U.S. companies doing business in India and Indian companies doing business in the United States. India, which is the world's largest democracy with a fiercely independent judiciary, has experienced phenomenal growth in the last decade with an average GDP growth of 8%. The World Bank and the IMF have projected that India's growth will resume at 6% or more by the next year from its current position. With the extraordinary growth rates and the several poverty alleviation measures that the government has taken, India's middle class will continue to expand. Therefore, it is evident that India as a whole is on a high growth trajectory. The U.S.-India trade relationship has grown exponentially from 2005 to 2013. The total merchandise trade grew from 26.72 billion to 63.70 billion, of which the U.S. merchandise exports to India grew from 7.9 billion to 21.8 billion, an impressive jump of 175%. The total trade in goods has also risen, and the quantum leaps have made India the United States' 11th largest merchandise trading partner. These numbers will only rise. U.S. exports to India in services has also grown from 10.6 billion in 2005 to 27.61 billion in 2011, an increase of nearly 175%. With the crossing of the 100 billion mark in the trade relationship, the potential for greater engagement is clear. U.S. companies have invested over 50 million in India directly or through Mauritius or Singapore. American, American companies across sectors such as pharma, automobiles, construction equipment, financial services, information technology, and food processing have experienced tremendous increase in sales and profits over the last five years. Ford India has experienced a growth of 211.56%, Caterpillar of 187%, and JP Morgan of about 93%. Several companies have become household names, such as McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Pizza Hut, etc. Several US pharmaceutical companies have increased their market share and market capitalization since 2005. By 2012, Abbott's market share increased to 7.3% from 2.3% in 2005, and Pfizer's market share increased to 3.2% from 1.45% in 2005. Dividends remitted by seven U.S. pharmaceutical companies to the United States have increased by over 281% between 2005 and 2012. New investment opportunities have opened up for the United States companies through defense exports valued at approximately 10 billion. While not underestimating the challenges posed by the Indian market, I do hope this will allow consideration to the countless untold positive stories of successful U.S. companies in India. Further, fueling this growth are the growing investments of Indian companies in the United States. Despite the remarkable strides India has made in the last decade, it must be kept in mind that India is still a developing country with monumental human development challenges. India's current population uh, is 1.25 billion with a poverty headcount of 32.7% and 66% of our population under the age of 35. India has a massive trade deficit of USD 195 billion, twice that of the United States. Between 2001 and 11, almost 92 million people migrated from rural to urban India, and currently about 1 million people enter the workforce every month. Needless to say that the, these realities demand proactive steps from the government to ensure that India's employment and education opportunities are adequate to secure countries' development. 
The last decade has witnessed a substantial liberalization of the FBI regime in India. FBI is permitted in manufacturing without any prior approval, in domestic airlines, mass rapid transport, housing, petroleum, financial service, telecommunications, etc. India has been rated among the top investment destinations globally by international bodies, including the World Bank and the UNCTAD. According to India's Ministry of Commerce and Industry, cumulative global FDI inflows in, from 2002 to 2012 stand at 164 million. The United States accounts for 6% of the total FDI flows into India. Coming to the various concerns that the US companies have expressed, let me state just one thing. When, United, when Secretary Kerry came to India in 2013, he raised four issues in particular. Intellectual property protection, local content restrictions, caps on FDI, and cross-border taxation. I would like to highlight that India has addressed three of these four concerns. On the tax environment, United States companies have expressed concerns about India's taxation system, in particular the use of transfer pricing, general anti-avoidance rules, and retrospective amendments. In recognition, the government has initiated a dispute resolution panel since 2009 and has since then taken initiatives to defer the GAR, introduced safe harbor rules and advanced pricing arrangements and set up a tax administration reforms committee. Today, the multinational companies can choose between the, uh, GAR, the safe harbor rules, which are now aligned and offer five-year tax certainty. Recent reports suggest that a solution to transfer pricing disputes is underway with 70 US <coughs> firms, either two involved in litigation, having entered into bilateral advanced pricing agreements with the tax authorities. This would ensure that the US and India are on common tax grounds. <coughs> CII believes that a well-administered safe harbor regime with unambiguous rules is in the interest of India and will arrest the increase in transfer pricing litigation. On the gender, general anti-avoidance rule, the government is sympathetic to Indian industry concerns that GAR should be applied as an exception rather than a rule and only for abusive transactions. The operation of GAR has been deferred to April 1, 2015. The Indian government has assured business its commitment to offer a stable and a non-adversarial tax regime and a fair and just dispute resolution mechanism and steps are underway. Coming to local sourcing requirements in retail, According to a CII Boston Consulting Group report, the total retail business in India is likely to touch 1,250 billion by 2020. Recognizing that the entry of MNCs into India's retail space would help develop the country's cold storage and supply chain systems, the government has opened the multi-brand retail for FDI up to 51% and lifted the FDI cap on single brand retail from 51 to 100 percent with requirements of local sourcing. Several global giants have already expressed their intention to come into India. CII is supportive of the local content requirement in multi-brand retail because, one, CII has found that many retailers source locally, especially categories like food, <coughs> grocery, and the fast-moving consumer goods. This helps local manufacturing and generates employment. Small and medium enterprises account for a staggering 22% of India's GDP and about 45% of the manufacturing output. These are essential to India's growth. Organized retail globally provides opportunities to smaller manufacturers to supply goods nationwide. The collaborative opportunity will enable the small and medium enterprises to improve their competitiveness as well as their quality substantially. CII hopes that the U.S. retail giants will work with the government to resolve the outstanding issues and enter this lucrative market. Coming to the preferential market access rules for electronic goods, it's important to note that currently India meets over 60% of the domestic demand for electronics goods through imports, which will aggregate to a demand supply gap of about 300 billion by 2020. Clearly, this is unsustainable for India, in fact, indeed, for any country. The electronic system and design manufacturing sector is strategic of, of strategic importance to India 
for its internal security, telecommunications, power, railways, other things. Given the critical importance, India does want to develop its own and support its own nascent industry. And that was the origin for the preferential market uh, 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 access rules. I would like to highlight that the policy is now being modified and is only restricted to government procurement. A 100% foreign-owned Indian company has equal access under the PMA. Coming to patentability, I would like to quote President Obama when he spoke on the healthcare bill in the US. That's always our goal, to free families from the pervasive fear that one illness or injury might cost you everything that you dedicated a lifetime to build. Our goal has always been to declare that in this country, the security of healthcare is not a privilege for a fortunate few. It is a right for all to enjoy. No different is India's aim of providing universal access to affordable healthcare based on a commitment to health as a human right. For its 1.25 billion people, a large population of whom are poor. India's legal system provides adequate protection for intellectual property. While the Novartis case has drawn the ire of various US pharma companies, contextually, very little has been said about the parallel string of litigation involving infringement of patents, where the Indian courts have granted interim injunctions and companies have been successful. Can you kind of wrap up on this? I would just wrap up in two minutes, sir. Thank you. Well, Quicker than that right. CII believes that India's patent laws are fully compatible, so are the copyright laws. Uh, on the compulsory licensing, I would just like to state that only one compulsory license has been granted and one has been rejected. Uh, just, I would also like to state, and I will state that in greater detail in my written testimony, that the number of patent applications by U.S. companies has increased substantially from 3,910 in 2001-2 to about 10,600. And out of the 5,118 pharmaceutical patents granted, 72% have been granted to foreign companies. Right, right. I think at the, at the end, what I would like to say is CII does support compulsory licensing with the rider that uh, the patent office must have the benefit of experts in medical science and engineering and management and economics, and there should be some form of post-license monitoring of the licensee to ensure that the objectives of compulsory license have been met. CII has been in, always supported the dialogue between different countries, between the India and the US, and would be very happy to continue to support the dialogue to arrive at a balance of the balances of the trade and the strategic partnership that India and the United States share. Thank you, sir.